So, uh, and I should warn you, the first maybe two minutes are going to be unavoidably bright. I apologize. The rest of the slides will be dark, but brace yourselves. Um, I'm a big fan of the work that Stripe does. I find it's really uh, whimsical and detailed. I remember when this mesh gradient came out and it was like a big deal. But all their pages are really interactive, dynamic. You have this 3D globe that you first might think is a video, but then it changes as you scroll. So it really shows that it's a 3D model. Uh, very, very cool stuff. When you actually log in to the Stripe product, though, it's a little bit like stepping through a door into a different universe. Like, there's no mesh gradients, there's no floating globes. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, you know, it's a business-to-business -business SaaS product. You don't necessarily need a bunch of whimsical flourishes. But my point is that, like, just looking between the two, right, it's very clear that it's a different product built by a different team using different tools. And it probably won't surprise us to learn that the dashboard uses React. So if you have the dev tools, it'll tell you this page is built using React. And the landing pages are not. They do not use React. And I've seen the dev team talk about the tools that they use. It's a lot of uh, vanilla JavaScript and like custom packages, but no component framework, no React, no Vue, no Angular. I think this makes sense. Like, you know, we think of React, like this looks like a React application. It's data-driven, it's full stack, it's all the stuff we've been talking about. And so you might reasonably wonder, like, why would you want to use React to build something like this? And that's what I'm here to talk about today. This talk is called The Whimsical Potential of JavaScript Frameworks. And I want to share how I've been using React uh, to build some pretty playful, whimsical details. I also realized I don't have a water, so I'm going to steal one of these while we let my uh, very fun title screen play out. So, um, for those who don't know, I have a blog. I blog at joshwcomo.com. And when I built this blog, I sort of figured that this was going to be my playground. So I was going to indulge all of the whimsical ideas that I had. So if there was like a playful idea I wanted to do, I was going to do it. This, I was sort of inspired by those like iron shavings you get with a magnet, and you move the magnet and the iron shavings ripple around. Um, it's exactly the sort of like kind of pointless but fun little detail that uh, I say yes to when it's my blog because it's my own little playground and I can do whatever I want. One of the little details, and I'm going to zoom this way, way in. Oh, this part's also, let me, hold on. Dark mode. Um, the, uh, this little fella down over here, there's a bunch of little details to it. Uh, it tracks your cursor, so the heart itself rotates depending on your cursor position. A little bit more subtle, the eyes move independently, and I don't know how clear that is, but uh, small thing. If you come near the like button, but then move away, if you don't engage with it, he gets a little bit sad. Because, <laughs> you know, he's a like button. Like buttons like to be clicked, but he doesn't stay sad very long. I decided to make him very cheerful. And of course, like, you can click on it. I wonder if I have sound. Let me see. That's fine. It makes a little glug noise. You can imagine that. Um, and if you keep clicking it all the way, eventually you get to the top and you get a little pop of confetti. Um, a little Easter egg that people don't know. You can right click to remove likes. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so you can have fun with that. Um, so this is essentially what I want to talk about. There we are. And we're going to build this. We're going to build an egg. Uh, I chose an egg because it's a slightly simpler shape. And we're going to focus on the cursor tracking, so the head rotation and the eye translation. Now, even before we get to React, right, what are the things that we have to know to build this sort of interaction? Well, I need to know where in the viewport the cursor is. And the way we typically do this is by measuring the distance from the top left corner in pixels. So as you move more to the right, your x value gets higher. As you move down from the top, your y value gets higher. I also need to know this. I need to know the bounding box. For, oh, it's such a, like a weird angle to look at. You need to know where in the viewport the element is, right? Because right now it's in the center, but you don't want to assume that. And if you have those two pieces of information, you can do the math to figure it out. So like if the mouse is over here, it's to the left of the egg, so the eyes have to shift sideways to the left, and the head has to rotate counterclockwise. Let's talk about how we would do this in vanilla JavaScript. So no React, nothing like that. I'll make this a bit bigger, too. So I have an event listener. We're putting it on the window object. That means that all this code is going to run whenever the user moves the mouse. We need to figure out the mouse position. We can get that from the event that gets passed in. And then to get the actual heart element, uh, we look it up with query selector. And then we get the bounding box with get bounding client rect. How many people have used this method? Or I guess I can see hands, so make some noise. <laughs> it 
It's a very cool method. Essentially, if you don't know what it is, it gives you a bunch of information as a JavaScript object about the element you've looked up, so the width and the height, and then like this distance from the left edge of the viewport to the left edge of the element, and from the top of the viewport to the top of the element. And so with those two pieces of information, with the user's mouse position and with the bounding box for this element, you can pass it into this calculate rotation function, and it'll give you uh, the rotation in degrees. Now, I was, you know, it's always a bit of a debate. I want to show you exactly what this function does, but our time together is limited, and I don't necessarily think that, like, getting into trigonometry is the best use of that time. So I'm going to treat this as a black box. I give it those two pieces of information, and it spits out the angle that it needs to rotate at. But now's a good time to mention, actually, I'm going to be sharing a slide at the end with a link to all of this code. So if you are curious, if you want to see exactly how this works, you will be able to do that. Finally, we, got, we get that rotation value, and we apply it as a CSS transform, setting uh, an inline style, essentially. So what do we think about this? Like, does this work? Well, it works as a prototype. It works as an MVP. But there's often like, quite a lot of distance between like, it works on my machine in localhost and it's production ready. Uh, for one thing, all of this code runs a lot, like dozens and dozens of times a second. And the problem with that is that getting a client rect, getting a bounding box, is kind of slow. If we think about it, right? This box doesn't really change as the user moves their mouse. Certainly, it does. Actually, it changes very slightly because of the rotation. But the center doesn't change. And so like, if we want this to be performant, do we really have to be recalculating that box dozens and dozens of times a second? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab these two lines, and I'm going to move them up, like, up above the event handler. So now it only does this work when I move the mouse. But this doesn't really work super well either. Like, For example, we do need to recalculate the bounding box when the user scrolls. Because right now, when the user's at the top of the page, this, oh, at the top of the page, this is the distance. But as, oh, testing. As they scroll, that distance changes. So, and you see what I'm saying, right? Like, there's this journey between the working prototype and the production-ready version. In addition to everything I already had, I also have to add event listeners to the scroll event, to the resize event. I'm also using resize observer and being a little bit fancy. Uh, this will tell me not only um, if the, actually, I don't think it does tell you if the window resizes. It tells you if the element resizes or if one of its ancestors has like a change in CSS that causes it to resize. So this is better, but there's still like a bunch of stuff missing. Like for one thing, I should be cleaning up these event listeners, right? It's one thing to start that work. We also want to stop it. Like if the, user, if the user navigates away from this page, we shouldn't still be tracking the mouse position. And you know, maybe we want to debounce this so that we're not calculating it on every scroll event, because that too fires like really, really rapidly. So let's talk about how React can solve some of these problems. And we have uh, it now running in React. Because this is a React conference, I'm going to assume that you're all somewhat familiar with the fundamentals of React. Even if you're not, though, I think this will make sense. We're going to keep things pretty high level. So like right away, we see something kind of cool. Const mouse position is equal to use mouse position. I have this custom hook, which does what we just talked about. It tracks the user's mouse position. It stores it as a state variable, which means that this component re-renders whenever the mouse position changes. And I've also snuck in the cleanup work. And even though I've been using hooks for like three or four years now, this still just seems so cool to me. Like it's one line of code that tells me not only what the mouse position is initially, but what it is at every moment in time as the user moves the mouse. And it also sort of magically bundles in the cleanup and teardown work. Like, you know, reusability is not a React thing. Like, JavaScript has functions, and that's typically been our tool to reuse logic. But a plain function can't, like, include the setup work and the teardown work that happens at an unknown time later. So it's really cool. One line of code does all that. Similarly, I have this line to get the bounding box, and this too has a bunch of stuff that we uh, sort of alluded to. Like, I am actually doing my cleanup now. I'm also doing some debouncing so that uh, it doesn't fire more than it has to. And because we're doing the cleanup work now, if this component gets unmounted and remounted, we're going to remove the event listener, disconnect the resize observer, and that means we avoid the memory leak of like stacking all these event listeners every time the component re-renders. Now, this works pretty well. 
It does occur to me, though, and I don't know how obvious this is, uh, if I move very quickly, it's not super smooth. And that's because I'm not actually like animating here. I'm not doing any sort of CSS transition or anything like that. Um, it's a one-to-one -one mapping of the user's mouse position to the rotation of the egg and the translation of the eyes. If I want it to be like smoother when we do this kind of jerky motion, well, maybe we can use a CSS transition. Let's try that. I'll say transition equal to transform. I don't know, 500 milliseconds. Let's try that. I'm also going to comment out the eye transform because I'm only going to worry about the head uh, rotation. Actually, before I do that, I should finish showing how this code works. I uh, drew this as an SVG in Figma, and then I copied the SVG. There are tools you can plug in your SVG code, and it gives you JSX. Honestly, it's pretty much the same, but you have to like, like this has to be, uh, this is what it would be in an SVG, and you have to camel case it. Um, so it's really cool, actually, that like SVGs can be used in React like this, but that's a whole other point. Um, I have the CSS transition now transform 500 milliseconds, and if I move in a very specific way, it looks okay. But if I keep moving, it's frozen in time. You might think, okay, maybe that's because this is the wrong value. Like, let's do 50 milliseconds instead. And this is like even worse somehow. Like, it's, it's not good. And the reason for that is the CSS transitions don't handle interrupts particularly gracefully. And so what's happening here is I'm re-rendering this code over and over whenever the user moves the mouse. And we keep starting and canceling these CSS transitions. So I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to re bring back the I transform. And I'm going to use a library. I'm going to use React Spring. So I'm going to import use Spring from React Spring. I'm also going to fix the typo. There we go. And I need this animated tool that I will explain shortly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the CSS that I want to apply and this SVG transform into this function. And if the value goes from being like minus 10 degrees in one frame to plus 10 degrees in the next frame, it's going to smoothly interpolate and essentially give me a bunch of intermediate values. And it's going to do it using the beauty and magic of spring physics. So the way that works, I'm going to call use spring. I'm going to pass that object in. I'll do the same thing for the I transform. And when I do that, it does not work at all. And the reason for that is that uh, I've gone from taking a plain CSS set of uh, a key and a value, like this used to be a string, but uSpring produces a complicated interpolation object, and our humble SVG DOM node doesn't know how to deal with that. So that's where this animated helper comes in. I have to swap out this SVG for an animated SVG. And by the way, this doesn't actually change the DOM node. Like either way, um, we're still going to get an SVG rendered in the DOM. What this does is it wraps it in a component that returns that underlying tag, but it also knows how to unpack those spring values. And now, check it out. No matter how quickly I move the mouse, the motion is smooth, and it's just so like fluid and organic and delightful, I think. <laughs> it is fun. I think the thing that's really cool about this is that Think about how much code I had to change there. Like, I took this object I already had, I wrapped it in uSpring. I took this SVG I already had, and I appended like a few characters to the start of it. And like we saw with my custom hooks over here, all this stuff, all this complicated stuff happens under the hood. Like, this takes care of the cleanup work, it takes care of the teardown work, and I get it for free. Uh, like, I don't even have to write this complicated ish code to start with. I can just use this library, and it comes with all that stuff bundled in. Um, so there's like a couple points here, right? One is that the React ecosystem is really powerful, and that's true, but there are lots of ecosystems that are really powerful. Um, you know, GSAP is a really amazing tool for vanilla JavaScript, but the thing we get by using React to do this is we have this centralized process that we can hook into. That's why they're called hooks, right? Um, we can benefit from the fact that React knows when this component is rendered and unmounted um, to hook into those processes. So this was where I was initially planning on ending the talk, but I had an idea. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could create like a 3D model of an egg in Blender? How much work would it be to update this code to render a 3D egg rather than the admittedly kind of crude two-dimensional SVG that I created? And the answer is that it's maybe not as much trouble as you might think. Hopefully the Wi-Fi cooperates. Yeah, there we go. 
So it looks pretty similar. I can uh, do the same sort of cursor tracking, but now it's a 3D model, so I can move it in 3D space. <laughs> it is very fun. The way that this works is using a library called React 3 Fiverr. And if you're not familiar, it is essentially a React renderer for 3JS primitives. So like we have React DOM that renders divs and spans and inputs, like we have React Native that renders whatever the primitives are in mobile. I don't know, I'm not a mobile developer. Um, this is a renderer for 3D primitives. And so uh, if we look, actually, let's start here. With what I'm actually rendering, I have my 3D model stuff. I have a camera. I have orbit controls, which is what allows me to do this. I have uh, a light, which we're going to talk about more in a second. And I have an environment. But check out how much of the code stayed the same. I'm using the exact same custom hook for getting the mouse position, the exact same custom hook for getting a bounding box. I'm even using the same library. Like I'm using use spring to animate the same thing so my frantic cursor doesn't get super uh, abrupt. So like, it's amazing to me that so much of this stays the same, even though we're rendering something in a completely different environment. Now, I mentioned I wanted to talk more about some stuff down here. If I zoom way in, there we are. I imagine this looks pretty cool on the planetarium. Um, you can kind of see that there's some texture being reflected in the eyes. That's coming from this environment. If I get rid of it, and I'll zoom back out, we have this point light, which is, as it sounds, it's a light that is a point that emanates out in all directions. And I'm making it animated, which means if I scroll up over here, I can animate where the light is, which I just think is the coolest thing in the world. Like, if we wanted to, we could move the light underneath, and now it's like spooky story time, <laughs> which is cool. Um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Making sure I'm not forgetting anything is always the challenge. Um, so I think this kind of goes a little bit further to explain what I'm saying, right? All the stuff that I'm doing here is leveraging this ecosystem, but it's made possible by the fact that I have this long-running centralized processor. It's a little bit like, like if you go to the symphony, you have all these individual musicians that are all playing their instrument, but you have this conductor, which is the one making it all possible. This is a little bit of a nod to Rachel's uh, React head or React person. I forget what, exactly, but yeah. So I do think it is a really handy tool for that reason. That's my talk. If you'd like to see any of the code that I mentioned, you can go to joshwcomo.com slash summit. I also uh, have a newsletter you can join, and I'll be sending something a little bit interesting to that newsletter group in a few days related to the courses that I have. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Josh. <laughs>